We are we are launching a wonderful book today. Um, the book has been released in other parts of, of the country, but since this is an author who so many of you and so many of us have been following from the very beginning, I think now it's officially launched. When it will be launched here, or um, I'd like to see in our head. Um, Anjum is uh, one of India's finest writers. He's also a superb critic. Um, you can read a bit. Caravan most recently, and all she's done us the, the great privilege of releasing each of her books here in, in Goa uh, as they've come out. And over time, I know many of you have become very big fans of hers. Um, and this is this book is a remarkable achievement. I'm not going to go too much into it because you can find many detailed and wonderful uh, reviews of it on, online. And now you'll learn more about it and and also a bit more about how what went into the book. Um, and here to launch the book is um, Dainita Singh, who you all are familiar with from yesterday, but also Dainita is, um, I hope you won't mind me saying this, Dainita, I say to everyone now, because I've been saying it for years, that you are India's greatest living artist, um, as far as I, I, I've been saying this for some years now, and uh, I think history is slowly catching up to my judgment. But it's, I think it's un unquestionably true. Um, the, where Dianita is and what Dianita does, I think no, uh, even historically, if you look at the trajectory of modern contemporary Indian art, no one has gotten to the places and is in the places that Dianita is. And she's also continually pushing the boundaries. Uh, yesterday, quite remarkable uh, keynote, uh, had a lot about Instagram, which is something that, uh, you know, uh, left me, I, I don't have a smartphone either, um, I, I barely go on to Instagram, so I don't know what it's about, but now I know I must. Um, and many ideas from there are, are still flying around with a number of us, so uh, it's a wonderful privilege to have Dianita with us. Thank you so much, Anjum and Dianita. Um, I think maybe we can start with uh, officially launching the book in a way, a, a photo op, is that okay with you? Stand and hold the book. Would that be okay? <laughs> No, no, you must do it. There's a form. There's a form. Please. Photographer, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations on the cosmopolitan. Okay, you're in for a treat. Over to you. Thank you for inviting me to, I'm not, again, I'm not sure why I've been asked to do this uh, book launch, um, other than being a pretty average artist. Um, but since you've asked me, I come from quite a different literary world. I don't read as most of you read. I read in fits and starts, and I read to see not what you write, but how you write. I want to know what you're getting at. I want to very quickly, if I can do it physically, go past, if I was weaving, I want to go behind the threads and I want to see what you're, what is that something else? And I think we are both artists. We are both storytellers. You build, if I may say so, your narrative, you build with the words. I start with a photograph that has too much narrative, and I try to build down. I try to take the context away, as you have so beautifully described in that Baban passage. Um, the woman's plain crumpled sari and her unadorned face, the way Baban had le leached time and place from around her had emptied the photographs of context. And I thought, oh my god, Anjum has really been following me. But Anjum has been picking up on these things. And as I flip through the book, backwards and forwards, and I try not to get into the plot, I'm trying very hard not to get into the plot, because I'm interested in that something else that you and I both try to get to. We start with something, we want to dismantle it, but what is that something else? And I'm hoping in this short session 
we can talk about that because that to me is the common area in all the arts. It's about the creative process and that's what I'm really interested in, not if I will be excused for saying so, not the exact plot. It's again it's for me it's not what do you say, it's how you say. And it's the same when I'm reading a historian's book as well. So it's not just to do with fiction or poetry. Um, and that too I read in fits and starts. So I wanted to start in a very probably non-conventional way at these events. But I wanted to ask you to describe to me in every little detail how you write. Starting with what is the view if there is a fixed place to your writing. Is there a fixed place to the writing? Um, Okay, can I take a step back before sure. I do that? <laughs> to say first, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled, A, to be in Goa, and like Vivek said, um, it's wonderful uh, to be able to launch this book here because I have associated all my books, the journey with talking about them in Goa and often at this very venue, so I'm very, very happy about that. And also, Dayanita, that you agreed to do this conversation with me is an absolute honor. So I must thank you at the very outset. Um, looking at the way you've annotated my book and the fact that you've got these little diagrams at the back and that you're actually starting on the last page makes me think maybe I'm going, maybe this is a new beginning for me and maybe I will henceforth write my books <laughs> very, very differently. Because I belong to a tradition or at least imagine myself belonging uh, to the tradition that a lot of, actually a lot of contemporary Indian English writers and English show belong to, which is the grand 19th century realist tradition of the novel. Not all of them, but most of them. Most of us do see ourselves one way or another as storytellers um, and therefore trying to follow that famous Flaubertian dictum. The author must be like God, you know, present everywhere but visible nowhere. Oh my God. So the idea, your question is very unsettling because you're telling me reveal exactly how you work but that's exactly my object. I am everywhere but you're not supposed to see my hand. You're supposed to imagine and this is the, this is, this is the great fiction about fiction that this world that I've created around this character called Kayanat, this 53 year old woman who once wanted to be an artist and couldn't, but it's, is still in some ways completely immersed in art, is uh, in the fictional sense an absolutely real world. And that's the challenge of the realist novelist, that you create this world sure. which your reader knows is fiction but believes at the same time yeah. to be absolutely true. Um, and I've, I've actually, as I've been writing this, partly because it's also a novel about art, I've also been thinking about the art of fiction mm. and hence asking you to be in conversation I think was an extension and therefore I'm saying maybe I will then hopefully end up then writing some other very different kind of fiction in the future which is to not just write novels but to also think how novels are made, your question. Um, and there are writers who've reflected on that. Um, sure. Again, very re writers completely married to the realist conventions, to the realist tradition. One of them, for instance, is Orhan Pamuk, who you, yes. you must have read. Absolutely. Um, and he has a wonderful book called The Naive and Sentimental Novelist. It's a book of essays on the, on the art of fiction, but much more on the pleasures of reading <laughs> fiction that you can completely immerse yourself in, this Flaubertian kind of fiction. And of course, he's talking very much of the 19th century European and Russian novel, uh, because that is the kind of novel that creates these vast landscapes that are peopled by so, so many things. They are characters, but they're also these large historical events. And you approach it like a painting. You see this incredibly huge, detailed canvas. And as you go closer, you start discerning the details. So, I mean, Pavok is a, a partic very particular kind of realist novelist. Uh, and he's also played with that form. In Actually, in the Istanbul book, first I used to think Sebald was the only one who had done that mix between image and text in literary fiction so well, or non-fiction, however you want to classify it. Um, and then I saw, the next person I saw was Pamuk. And he did that with Istanbul. 
and he also has that similar feel for the image. And I think the novel of the future, it's inex inescapable that there will be there will be physical imagery there. So which is why I was urging writers to look to photography. I always urge photographers to look to literature and they must and they have to and there is no other way. But I think, I think things are moving in another direction and maybe writers might like to consider their relationship with photography, whether it's their own or it's found or it's cut up from my books. But that there are other, and that, we, we, we don't have so much time. I would have loved to discuss the form of this book and the, the book cover and the object that it makes. I was trying to photograph it at breakfast this morning and I realized that a nicer way to make the release would have been to use the book as a building block and to make an architecture out of it. So to me, that something else comes out of constantly, constantly pushing, pushing, pushing. There is, like you say, there is also a format for the photo book and how a photo book must read, and how the story must develop. And I feel it's very important. I tell young people, don't show me your work, because I will cut up the dummy, and I will shuffle it all, and then reshuffle it. And it's a little bit what I was doing with your book, and finding different things on different pages for myself. For example, you said you know, that you, you, you may not be so comfortable talking about your process, because that's not what it's about. But, you know, curiosity is curiosity. And I'm going to write about these boys, but they won't talk to me. I want to know what kind of lives they lead, everything. What they feel when dancing, childhood memories of what they learned, which gods they love, what they've seen on their travels, how they're able to become another people while dancing. I could bring that right back to you to talk about how you become another people while writing, but I also want to go back to that earlier person who I presume, do you have a desk? Is there a desk at which you write? There is a desk at which I write, yes. Does it have a window? Um, I actually write on two different desks. Tell me about in that, two in different, every detail. Um, in two different places. Um, I think with the arrival of the laptop, place becomes, to me at least, place has become less important. Especially when you're writing fiction, where I'm not necessarily drawing on other books or I need a library of reference books around me. It's really me and the screen. Um, and where I am, I mean, I certainly need to be in a place where I am feeling comfortable and not distracted. So not an airport transit lounge? Not an airport transit lounge and certainly not a room in which there are any other people. Ah, that's so interesting. So aloneness, aloneness is very important. And also a slight feeling of doing something a little uh, subterranean, underground, secret. I think that's very important to me to the in the process of writing fiction, the feeling that um, this is between me and this book and it's not something I necessarily want to do in a very public way. Um, so you could read in a public way, you could research Absolutely. in a public way, yeah. but the writing... And I think, again, this is especially true of fiction because I've noticed that novelists who have gone too far into their public roles as activists or political commentators have then found it hard to go back to the fiction. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's because there's something inescapably, if not frivolous, at least playful about writing fiction. And if you, as some of us, some of my contemporaries have done, uh, slightly older or slightly younger contemporaries have done, which is written very successful first novels or first two novels and then become sort of swallowed by that public role that the writer uh, imposes of them, on them, and then not being able to find a way back into fiction. So I kind of worry about that sometimes. Um, are we reading fiction too much for the themes that it is talking about rather than the sensibilities and the emotions involved, which to me are as crucial? Uh, and therefore fiction is a very, I, I don't have the answer to how exactly it differs from 
a work of history or a work of work of politics or a newspaper report or you know um, any other form that is not fictional but I'm sure I'm quite sure it's having written in both these forms and other forms I'm quite sure it's different and the sitting alone in the room um, doing something that feels slightly um, music what do you mean is there is it okay if there's music around um, sometimes sometimes it's okay maybe when I'm editing certain kinds of music yeah, I mean, I'm, I like was what was the? I want to know. I want to know what music you were listening to when you wrote the Cosmopolitans. I want to know uh, the films you were seeing when you wrote the Cosmopolitans. Those are the things I want to get at, and I'll tell you why. Because I think if we really want to make some kind of a contribution in in my field, for example, I think that if I could get to the source of creativity, if I could get to that the ways in which people get to that something else, then perhaps there is a course on creativity to be taught. There is a certain level of creativity that we can at least how to nurture that creativity, no? Because if I may presume, and you know, hit me on the head if I'm talking way out of turn, that you have you have some rumblings and there is certain people, space, some kind of a narrative there. But then there might, must be a long time between that actually actualizing, no? And you don't even know what form it might take. So I would say in our creative course, if we were to call it that, it would be about how do you nurture that space? And it could be precisely like you just said, about not <laughs> revealing, you know, not talking about it. Because if you talk about it, if I photograph, if I put a photo on Instagram of exactly what I'm working on, that is my big dilemma with my great Instagram find, that I have to go quite far away from what I'm working on otherwise. That I have to lead a parallel life, otherwise it will become, unless I'm ready to bring that other work into Instagram, and as I said, make an Instagram book, could the future of the photo book an Instagram book where I feed in daily or weekly and that's how the book grows. I already do that with those hashtags that are, you know, I'm going to hashtag this uh, Museum of Architecture because that's how I photographed it at the breakfast table. So I'll take it into another area. We call them sort of poetic hashtags. They're yeah. not, they're sort of they are not literal. The opposite of that in fact. So there'll be this and there'll be museum of glass and you know it's not glass. But I, took, I must come back to you. Um, the, how do you hold some rumblings that are there? Do they sort of stew inside for a while? Yeah, so what we're, what we're talking about I think is what is creativity or what are the sources of creativity and can we isolate them and then maybe share them in a form that is intelligible? Is it possible? Is it possible? Um, and this is a question that actually is asked in creative writing I courses. I don't know if it's asked in art school. Maybe it is. Not at all. <laughs> Whether is art something that can be taught? It's certainly asked in creative writing schools. Is creative writing something can be taught? Uh, something which can be taught? And I think. Um, certain things can be shared and certain things are pure instinct so how do you how do you isolate how do you even how do you even talk about instinct it's very very hard but that's the key that's the key and how do you hone that instinct how did you Anjum hone that instinct I think it's 90% your instinct but the instinct is not something in the air it's something that you have worked at it's something it's a very uh, nurtured instinct. Well, it's a difficult thing to talk about in itself. Sure. And it becomes harder because our language, our public language for talking about yes. writing is not the language of instinct. It's the language yes. of what is the subject of your book, what are the broadly the themes that you're talking about, why is your character X or Y, what are the psychological consistencies or inconsistencies why did she, she do X or Y halfway through, the, halfway through the book? It's not as convincing as it should be, or it's wonderfully convincing, I love it. So it becomes a discourse maybe that, which is useful to the reader, 
but it's certainly not a discourse that in any way attempts to talk about the book or the writing of fiction as an irreducibly instinctual thing, that irreducible quality mm -hmm. to the writing of fiction, that is very hard to talk, talk about and actually or actually, what is the irreducible? I don't even know that word. Irreducible means something that you can't break down any further. If I say this is my ins this is my instinct telling me that this is the tone. Stop now. This is the tone. No, what I'm ah. saying is that I cannot analyze it beyond saying that it is my instinct. That's what I mean by irreducible. Um, mm -hmm. And one way into the instinct would be to ask, what are my sources? What music did I yeah. listen to? What's the view outside my window? what's my mental makeup, though all that goes into the instinct, but it's still very, I, I don't know for sure if I can explain it. Absolutely. What I can say, what I can say is that, for, I just use the word tone. Now for me, that is part of instinct. There are many things that go into instinct. Is the choice of a word in a sentence, is the choice of the names of your characters, is the choice of location, it's so many things, but tone to me is very, very crucial. Um, and it's like, since we're, since we're talking about music, the tone in a piece of fiction is like the key in, in music. You know, it's that thing in which the whole thing unfolds. Once you find that, you've got... And so actually plot is much less important to me than key because I find plot much easier to do. But how do I find that, that voice in which I will be writing 400 pages of prose um, and I have to stay with it. Yeah. But it has to be, you know, even though many people, different people are talking, for this novel, for instance, um, it's written in an ironic tone. It's written in the tone of voice of a woman who's seen quite a lot of the world and has suffered certain disappointments but has not necessarily lost her sense of humor or her sense of hope. Now that is, that is tone. How do I get that? Mandakini, there is one thing we always do, and that is speak to each other with consideration. If that goes, everything goes. This tone of voice you're using with me, that was actually the first thing I underlined in the book. But in the sentences you said now, and I hope someone's recorded it, any photographers in the audience, you've just got the most important lesson on working, which is to try to see if you can hear the tone of the photograph. To not get caught up with the content, with what the narrative in the image is, but to try to listen to the photograph and then other stories reveal themselves. So to me, in photography, the plot is not really the main thing. In fact, the more subterranean the plot is, the more hidden it is, the better it is. But it's really about tone. And in my case, then, in my case, that would then 